starts live Wednesday, November 8th on ABC. Good morning, America. New this morning, heading abroad. President Trump stopping in Hawaii ahead of his overseas trip to five Asian countries, but facing lingering questions here at home about a 2016 campaign meeting. I don't remember much about that meeting. Plus, is Attorney General Jeff Sessions back in Trump's doghouse? Okay. Possible charges? The NYPD says it's gathering evidence for a potential rape charge against Harvey Weinstein. We have an actual case here. The movie mogul maintaining his innocence, why police haven't asked for an arrest warrant, and the new problems for actor Kevin Spacey as Netflix gives the House of Cards star the axe. Terror attack investigation. ABC News learning authorities questioned suspect Syflo Saipov's family, what his sister is saying this morning as security is tighter than ever for tomorrow's New York City Marathon. There will be uh, a substantial number of heavy weapons teams. And high-end recall. A million BMWs posing a fire risk. The warning from the luxury automaker, plus previous reports of cars catching fire. The ABC News investigation into the problem. Live from ABC News in New York, this is Good Morning America. Good morning. Paula is off. Very happy, though, to have Diane Macedo at the desk. Good hey, morning good to, to be you. Good to be here, everybody. Hi, Diane. Different seat than usual. If either of these guys bother you, just <laughs> oh, say something. Oh, he's got my me. back. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I like how things are starting over. off. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Rob, Rob's like, I'm not particularly worried about that. All right. Anyway, let's get right to our top story this morning. President Trump is waking up in Hawaii this morning. We've got some pictures from the president's Instagram account as he greets the locals wearing a leg. In a few hours, he'll be leaving Hawaii for a 13-day trip to Asia. He starts in Japan, then it's South Korea, China, Vietnam, and the Philippines, all amid serious concerns about the threat of a nuclear North Korea. But domestic concerns will not evaporate just because the president is away. In fact, before leaving for this trip, the president slammed the Justice Department for not investigating Hillary Clinton and the Democrats. Critics say the president is trying to distract from the Russia investigation, including new questions about this meeting with a foreign policy advisor named George Papadopoulos, who's now cooperating with federal investigators. We have team coverage this morning, and we're going to start in Tokyo, where ABC's senior White House correspondent Cecilia Vega is standing by. Cecilia, good morning to you. Hey guys, good morning to you. This is going to be a jam-packed trip for President Trump. It's his longest trip abroad since taking office. North Korea, of course, front and center, not to mention, as you say, all those controversies back at home. The first leg of the president's longest trip abroad kicked off in Hawaii, where President Trump and the first lady were welcomed with lays. After meeting top military brass, I'll tell you, this is very special to be in Hawaii. The president made his first ever visit to Pearl Harbor. He and First Lady Melania Trump boarded a boat to the USS Arizona Memorial, where they laid a wreath and tossed white flower petals at the side of the sunken ship, honoring the more than 2,400 Americans who died in the attack. Before leaving the White House on Friday, the president announced he'll be abroad even longer than planned. His trip, now a 13-day run to five Asian countries. And I think we're going to have great success. We'll be talking about trade. We'll be talking about, obviously, North Korea. We'll be enlisting the help of a lot of people and countries. The threat of North Korea looms large, but the Russia investigation back home also has the potential to overshadow what's being called his most important foreign trip yet. This morning, the Trump administration faces lingering questions about this March 2016 campaign meeting, where, according to court filings, foreign policy advisor George Papadopoulos told the group, including President Trump and now Attorney General Jeff Sessions, he had connections with Russia that could help arrange a meeting between Trump and Vladimir Putin. I don't remember much about that meeting. It was a very unimportant meeting. It took place a long time. Don't remember much about it. Despite the president telling me shortly after election day. Did you or anyone in your campaign have any contact with Russia leading up to or during the campaign? Well, Nothing at all. Asked if he stands by that now, he says this. All I can tell you is this. There was no collusion. There was no nothing. It's a disgrace, frankly, that they continue. And those questions are sure to follow him here. Now, this is going to be the longest trip to the region by any American president in 25 years. The White House says this demonstrates President Trump's commitment to this region. But I got to tell you guys, 
This is the front page that the Japanese are waking up to this morning. Ivanka Trump on the front page, not her father. She was here uh, days early to uh, kick off this diplomatic mission, guys. Overshadowing dad. All right, Cecilia, thank you. And let's bring in ABC News political consultant Matthew Dowd, who's in Austin, Texas this morning. Uh, Matthew, thanks so much for joining us. Good morning. Thank you. So given what we're learning about the president and Jeff Sessions allegedly being in the room when this foreign policy advisor offered to arrange a meeting with the Russians, how worried should Trump be as he travels to Asia? Well, he should be very worried. And it's, it's interesting to me, you have George Papadopoulos and then his Carter Page. It's like the island of misfit advisors that are surrounding Trump in all of this. I think it's very problematic. And I think going on this trip, to me, it's a funny thing to watch. Is, is he's, it's as if he's going from a high-stakes Texas Hold'em tournament where all his chips are at risk, and he's going to take a break from that stress to do a high-wire juggling act. And that's the problem he's in right now. He leaves one situation to go into an even probably more problematic situation than he is in Asia. He's got uh, crises all around him, no question about that. Let me ask you about something he said before taking off. Uh, he's been taking aim at his own Department of Justice for not investigating Hillary Clinton. Take a listen to what he told our John Carl. I don't know. I'm really not involved with the Justice Department. I'd like to let it run itself. But honestly, they should be looking at the Democrats they should be looking at Podesta and all of that dishonesty. They should be looking at a lot of things. And a lot of people are disappointed in the Justice Department, including me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. So that was an answer to a question from John Carl, who asked, uh, should Jeff Sessions, your attorney general, be fired? And the president said, I don't know. Not exactly a ringing endorsement. But I guess the question for you is, is Trump right that the DOJ should be looking at Hillary and the Democrats? Was there some sort of uh, law breaking here? Or do you think this is an effort to distract from the Russia story? This is, to this is total misdirection. I mean, he might as well be David Copperfield in Las Vegas, the well, level of misdirection he's doing in this. You look at all of the things he's talked about. There's nothing to the uranium story. That's all been debunked. This idea that Hillary campaign and her campaign colluded with Russia, that's been debunked. And now this thing with Donna Brazil and the DNC and everything. All of us know that both parties rigged the process in order to, to engage a certain kind of voters. But this is standard procedure in what the DNC did and the agreements they had with Hillary Clinton. It's a total misdirection in order to get the spotlight off Donald Trump and the investigations he has in order to try to direct it somewhere else. He'd be better off leaving the Justice Department and Bob Mueller alone, let them do their job, and basically open it up and be transparent about it. I didn't see David Copperfield coming this morning. Uh, Matt, thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Great to be here. Really appreciate it. Matt Dowd weighing in from Austin this morning. Also this morning, the president is expressing outrage about the sentence for Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl, calling it a disgrace that the soldier turned captive will not be doing prison time. ABC's Gloria Riviera is in Washington with more on the judge's decision. This morning, Bo Bergdahl is a free man for the second time. These images showing his release in 2014 after five years held prisoner by the Taliban. His hollow, haunted eyes blinking back the unfamiliar sun. On Friday, Bergdahl avoided a prison sentence of 14 years for desertion and misbehavior before the enemy. Sergeant Bergdahl has looked forward to today for a long time. This has been a terrible ordeal. He's certainly glad this is over. A military judge instead handing him a dishonorable discharge and $10,000 fine. Bergdahl told the court, I understand leaving was against the law. I understand I endangered the safety of my platoon. Two soldiers were seriously wounded in the mission to find him. Sergeant Mark Allen shot in the head. Navy SEAL Jimmy Hatch had his leg ripped apart by a bullet. Initially, I thought, man, I'm dead. In his first television interview with British filmmaker Sean Langan, Bergdahl said he was tortured and confined to a cage after several attempts at escape. It's a cage that was welded together. It's about a seven foot long by about six foot wide. And how long were you in that cage for? Second, third, fourth, and into the fifth year. President Trump highly critical of Bergdahl. While campaigning, he blasted the deal President Obama made. Five Guantanamo Bay Taliban detainees in exchange for Bergdahl. We get a no good traitor and they get the five people that they wanted for years and those people are now back on the battlefield trying to kill us. On Twitter Friday, the president calling the verdict a complete and total disgrace to our country and to our military.
President Trump's repeated condemnation of Bergdahl may have actually helped him avoid jail time. The judge called Trump's disparaging remarks disturbing and said he might consider them mitigating evidence that didn't rule out a fair trial but may have eased sentencing. Bergdahl plans to appeal that dishonorable discharge. Dan, Diane. Yeah, Gloria, and the president's still speaking out about that. Gloria Riviera for us from Washington. Thank you, Gloria. And now to new developments in Hollywood's widening sexual misconduct scandal. The NYPD says it's gathering evidence for a potential rape charge against Harvey Weinstein. There are also reports that Scott Yard is investigating Kevin Spacey's alleged sexual, uh, sexual assault of a man back in 2008. This as Netflix gives the star of House of Cards the Axe. ABC's Eva Pilgrim is here with details on all of this. Eva, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. Overnight, Netflix making a big statement saying they don't want anything to do with House of Cards if Kevin Spacey is a part of it. The production house that creates the hit show has suspended the actor. This is allegations against some of Hollywood's once seemingly untouchable power players now turn into criminal investigations. New this morning, possible charges looming for former Hollywood power producer Harvey Weinstein. We have an actual case here. New York City police now saying they are gathering evidence to potentially arrest Weinstein for rape, but they don't know if it's enough to bring the case to trial. In order to go arrest Mr. Weinstein, we would need an arrest warrant. So that requires a court order. So we want to get our evidence first before we go out and do something like that. The case stemming from an investigation into claims that Weinstein assaulted Boardwalk Empire actress Paz de la Huerta in 2010. The actress saying Weinstein drove her home from a party and forced himself on her. If someone is, uh, is attacked and they give specific information as to what happened to someone else, that's often seen as enough corroboration to, to make an arrest. Weinstein's representative maintaining any allegations of non-consensual sex are unequivocally denied by Mr. Weinstein. Weinstein is not the only Hollywood elite being questioned. Police in London are now reportedly looking into allegations actor Kevin Spacey sexually assaulted a man in 2008. The Guardian newspaper reporting the alleged assault happened at the famed Old Vic Theater while Spacey was artistic director. This Facebook post from Mexican actor Roberto Cavezos claims the star routinely preyed on young male actors there. Chooses to debate me? Meanwhile, allegations from the set of Spacey's hit show, House of Cards, are mounting. Eight new accusers speaking anonymously to CNN, saying Spacey made crude comments and inappropriately touched them, creating a toxic environment for some young men on the set of the show. Now, Spacey making no comment on these latest accusations out of London, but his reps have said previously that he is taking time to seek evaluation and treatment. I think we may see more and more people coming under fire here. This is we an keep interesting, seeing people yeah, come out. interesting cultural moment. Eva, thank you very much. We're learning more this morning about the 29-year-old father of three accused of plowing a pickup truck into pedestrians and bikers in Lower Manhattan. The suspect's sister is now speaking out. This says the NYPD beefs up security across the city ahead of tomorrow's New York City Marathon. ABC's Ariel Reshef is at the finish line with the latest. Good morning, Ariel. Good morning, Diane and Dan. New York City on high alert after that terror attack. Officials say this New York City Marathon will have the tightest security ever in an effort to protect more than 50,000 runners and 2 million spectators here on Sunday. Unprecedented security spanning the route of the New York City Marathon five days after the bike path terror rampage that killed eight people in Lower Manhattan. We've also increased the number of observation teams and counter sniper teams. There will be uh, a substantial number of heavy weapons teams. Officials say there is no specific threat, but remain concerned about international terrorists and domestic extremists potentially targeting the event. We're going through every possibility. The heightened alert comes as investigators say they've tracked down Saifulo Saipov's last known contact questioning the man who spoke to the terror suspect on the phone moments before his murderous truck attack. ABC News has also learned authorities in Saipov's native Uzbekistan have interrogated his entire family. In an interview with Saipov's sister, she says investigators are still holding their father and uncle for questioning. Saipov's mother passing out in shock after hearing what her son had done. Three Argentinian survivors of Saipov's ramming embracing as they remembered their childhood friends. The five classmates mowed down, seen here celebrating the 30th anniversary of their high school graduation just hours before their death. New York City still reeling but resilient 
as runners take their marks this marathon weekend. And we're already seeing canine officers here at the finish line of the marathon. Officials say there will also be counterterrorism units, snipers, and helicopters keeping a watchful eye on the massive crowds, but they're, they're reminding everyone to be vigilant. Diane, Dan? All right, we're certainly thankful for their protection. Ariel, thank you. And we have some news now from the world of sports. ABC News is learning about the NFL owners who will be deposed in Colin Kaepernick's collusion case against the league. ESPN, uh, ESPN is reporting those owners are being asked to turn over correspondence about the quarterback and Ron is here with everything we need to know about this. Ron, good morning, sir. Uh, good morning to you, Dan and Diane. Remember that Kaepernick's lawyers have accused the owners of colluding, that they were working in concert to deny him a chance to play football. So what it looks like they're trying to do here is find evidence of that, that the owners are conspiring to deny him a second chance. This morning, former 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick alleging that some of the NFL's most powerful owners colluded to keep him out of football. The owners are being asked to hand over cell phone records and emails. They were chosen based on their public statements about either Kaepernick or the player protests during the national anthem. Kaepernick has filed a grievance against the NFL and all 32 team owners, according to documents obtained by ABC News. Kaepernick's lawyer claims multiple NFL head coaches and general managers stated that they wanted to sign Mr. Kaepernick only to mysteriously go silent. Kaepernick drew national attention last year for kneeling during the national anthem prior to games to protest social injustice against African Americans. The laundry list of owners being deposed includes Dallas Cowboys owner Jerry Jones, New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft, and Houston Texans owner Bob McNair. Colin Kaepernick is not going to be a good fit for every team, but the fact that he's right now a good fit for no teams is really stunning. Back in June, NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell shooting down suggestions that Kaepernick was being blackballed by the league. Obviously, you know, everyone's aware of the fact of uh, his protest last year, and that's uh, something that individual clubs will either way or not way. And to, uh, this week, just this week, two more quarterbacks went down with injuries with so many teams needing replacements at that position this season. Kaepernick's lawyer says it is statistically impossible his words that no team has signed Kaepernick unless he says they are blackballing him. That's really a lot of teams need quarterbacks. Yeah. No one's signing him yet. Yeah, interesting run. Thank yeah. you. Let's check the weather. What's up, Robert? Well, we're in the heart of football season, speaking of, in November. Also getting some snow across parts of the uh, Midwest and Northwest. Check it out. to St. Cloud, Minnesota there. Just enough on the roadways to get the plows and the salt trucks out there and cause a few accidents. So not a fun drive there yesterday across Minnesota. We're still looking at uh, some snow there. Also in Seattle, a dusting of snow. This is the earliest that they saw measurable snow in Seattle in 40 years after last year's historic uh, winter. Hopefully it won't be that bad this year, but they've got a chance for snow again this afternoon and tonight. We've got a winter storm watches and uh, advisories up for that area. The Ducks played uh, the Huskies tonight at UW. They might see some rain mixing in with some snow there and uh, we're watching the next system roll in which could pile up one to two feet in some of the mountains. That's a quick check on the national headlines. Time now for your local forecast. Temperatures this morning in the low 40s to low 50s for many of us, so it's quite a cool start. You will need the jacket on your way out the door. We'll have a few breaks in the clouds this morning, but added cloud cover this afternoon and a few showers pushing in late. Notice our daytime highs today only in the mid 50s to upper 50s, certainly much cooler compared to yesterday. Mostly cloudy skies and a few showers possible tonight. That'll be the case through tomorrow morning, but we also will be heating up. And in November, it's our second severe weather season. We've got a severe weather threat tomorrow across the Midwest. Talk more about that in the next half an hour, guys. Mm -hmm. Take, takes a confident man to wear a brown suit. You always yeah, say that. <laughs> November. Oh, man, it's so sharp on you. Thanks. I think it's working for you, Rob. <laughs> All right, guys. I All love right. it. I wouldn't wear it, but <laughs> you, you can get away with it. But you look great. You look fantastic. <laughs> All right, let's check I in with Ron now. The rest of the day's news. Ron, yeah. what's going on? Uh, well, good morning, everyone. We're going to begin right here in New York City, where lawyers for the Mexican drug lord, uh, Joaquin Guzman, nicknamed El Chapo, of course, have asked a court for a psychological evaluation of their client, saying that his prison conditions are driving him crazy. The lawyers are saying that during recent visits, they noted that Guzman has been hallucinating, repeating himself, and forgetting what the discussions are about. Guzman is jailed awaiting trial on drug charges in Brooklyn uh, Federal Court. In Tallahassee, Florida, another fraternity death, this time on the campus of Florida State University. Police say 
That 20-year-old Andrew Coffey was found unresponsive Friday morning. Investigators are not yet releasing how the, uh, the Pi Kappa Phi pledge died. According to the uh, Tallahassee Democrat newspaper, there was a party at their frat house uh, the night before. The fraternity is now suspended there. In Miami, six firefighters have been fired.